Hey everybody, Harry here and welcome to a very special one-on-one -on -one edition of Talking Feds. I'm thrilled to be joined by Rachel Maddow, whom you perhaps have heard of as the host of The Rachel Maddow Show, which airs live Monday at 9 p.m. on MSNBC. But you may be less aware of her role as one of the country's preeminent podcasters. Her 2019 uh, podcasting debut, Bagman, about uh, Spiro Agnew, which we won't be discussing today, but I'll just say if you haven't uh, heard it, run, don't walk to your nearest podcast uh, app. But um, no sophomore slump for her. She followed Bagman up with an eight uh, episode podcast entitled. Ultra, which examines the history, the, to us, obscure history, amazingly enough, of a seditious plot to undermine democracy some 80 years ago and the wild fight to stop it. So she's here today to talk about Ultra and also to set it off alongside our own uh, current struggles with seditious plots. Rachel Maddow, thanks very much for joining Talking Feds. It's great to see you, Harry. I've been so excited about this discussion. I'm so glad we were able to get it together. This is I'm, I'm really looking forward to this. Likewise, I'm sure. All right, I, I had one sort of um, question about both of your podcasts because when I sort of took a step back, the aspect that most stood out to me was this sort of gobsmacking quality, like, holy cow, I didn't, did I know that? How didn't I know that? Um, that that uh, came through both of them. So I just wondered, are, are these stories that you came across as you were uh, thinking of putting podcasts together, or did you know them already because they had such a sort of stunning... Uh, I, I couldn't believe that they were obscure to me and I think to most of America. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. You know, you mentioned the Bagman podcast as well, and that has a little bit of that quality, and I think the ultra podcast has even more of it in terms of people thinking, is, is this fiction? I thought I knew this history. Where did this yeah. come from? And in right. both cases, I feel like I knew a sliver of it. And so when things happened in the news and in current events that I was looking for historical resonance or historical precedence, like there was, there was enough there to kind of ring a bell, like, oh, go look at that. But then the thing that drew me into it was whatever little bit I remembered, as soon as I looked at it even a little bit more... It was not at all what I expected, and it was much more resonant and much more rich. And for me, the the sort of keyhole that um, led into the door of the Spiro Agnew story was the revelation that it wasn't the FBI that took down Spiro Agnew, and it wasn't adjacent to Watergate in any way. It was coincident with Watergate, but it was a completely different thing. And when the U.S. attorney, it was fascinating to me that when the U.S. attorney's office in Baltimore, what got on to Spiro Agnew, sort of despite themselves. They didn't trust the FBI enough at the time to bring them into the investigation. And instead, they brought in IRS agents as the investigators um, that ultimately led to the vice president, Agnew, having to resign ahead of a 40 count in federal indictment. Yeah. So that to me was like, oh, OK, this this has been overshadowed because of Watergate. But this is this is worth looking into and understanding. With Ultra, I was interested um, in, sad to say, because of its current resonance. I was interested in anti-Semitism in America and in the resurgence of Holocaust denial. And in looking at that, I started looking at the origins of Holocaust denial. And it turns out there is an incredible and very specific story there. Um, like Holocaust denial is a weird thing. It, 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 it originates in the United States in the 1940s when there's thousands of GIs around who have you know, laid eyes and, and refugees in this country, people who have laid eyes on the aftermath of, of the, the Holocaust. It's undeniable through human witnesses by the thousand. And yet people start promulgating it there for political reasons in, in the 40s with, the, with some surprisingly well-connected political allies. And in trying to look at that story, which is a story I might yet tell, yeah. I realized, like, where did these jerks come from? Like, these these seem like some particularly cretinous Americans. <laughs> where did what's their backstory? And that led me to this thing I had heard a little bit about the Great Sedition Trial of 1944. And then you scrape a little bit below the surface of it, and lo and behold, there's this incredible American history. Cretin sp uh, sp scattering everywhere. Yeah. So stunning. Oh. I have 16 things to say now about Bagman. I'm just going to skip them and be disciplined <laughs> and go straight to Ultra. 
Um, so it's set in the 1940s, the first half of the 1940s. It follows a rising, I think you could call it a fascist movement in the country. Okay, but now at the beginning of that period, at least before Pearl Harbor, there was uh, a significant opposition to entering the war that I think was wrongheaded, but still within a sort of relatively benign or within a kind of mainstream of political sentiment. We know about that. So I, I think the question that you just posed for me is how did that semi-respectable or, or you know, it's the kind of thing a politician, a Lindbergh could stand up and say, come to be aligned with both scurrilous and completely fictitious, you know, brazenly so, um, attitudes that were much more radical, anti-Semitic, as you say, eventually seditious. It's that kind of marriage that um, I think is uh, puzzling and really an important question for whenever this arises like today. I think that's right. And the, the, the initial premise of your question, I think, is important and easy to overlook from our vantage point now that we know what we know about World War II and what the yeah. result was of our intervention there. But opposition to entering World War II was not not an extreme position at all. It was very widely held. It was the majority position. It was, in fact, probably the only reason that FDR was reelected in 1940 was because he yeah. promised in the 1940 presidential election that we wouldn't get involved in the war. And Democrats and Republicans and third parties and the vast majority, not the vast majority, but the majority of the American public was very sympathetic to that idea that we just shouldn't get involved. We were exhausted from World War I and not sure that we should have done that. And um, that mainstream, respectable, rational uh, point of view then had some ragged edges. And they came, those, those ragged edges, what you describe as fascistic or indeed seditious, um, and in some cases, I think you could arguably say treasonous. Um, yeah. Yeah, we're at war. Movement. Unlike, yeah, we're at war at the time. We're about yes. to be, yeah. Once They're we're, an once, enemy under the Constitution, right? Once Germany declares war on us after we get attacked by yeah. Japan on, on, on Pearl Harbor, then it uh, it becomes a, legally a different thing yeah. and morally a different thing. Yeah. But you've got two, I think, things going on. One is that the Germans are spending millions and millions of dollars in 1940 dollars to propagandize the United States against getting into the war. And so they, they sort of piggyback onto the mainstream isolationist movement and decide to make it a German operation to the extent that they can. And there was German support for the America First Committee, for example. And there were German agents who were working to shape um, that movement and to drive it to its 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 sort of darkest, well, uh, its deepest reaches to the benefit of Germany. So that's part of what's going on. It's a foreign intelligence operation. But then there's also a, a pretty well established fascist movement in the United States, and it's not. I think that's harder for us to swallow. I mean, literally, right? It's not the dirty yeah. word that it is today. People stood up and identified themselves as fascists. Yes. Right? You was, have Coughlin yes. writing love letters to Mussolini. That's, yeah, they, yeah. There's a very, very prominent um, American intellectual at the time named Lawrence Dennis, who ends up right. being one of the sedition trial defendants. And his bestseller at the time is The Coming American Fascism. And uh, in 1940, I think, um, I think it was 40, maybe 41, um, Lindbergh's wife, Anne Morrow Lindbergh mm -hmm. had the best-selling nonfiction book in the country, which was also a book about the glorious fascist future that was coming to the United States. And there was an NBC radio program at the time called America's Town Hall or America's Town Hall, Town Hall of the Air or something like that. And one of their initial big national radio broadcasts was, should we turn to fascism? I mean, it was a um, Italy had done it. Germany had done it. It was yeah. seen as being the rising... Uh, political movement of the future. And there were big fascist organizing elements in the United States for a long time. So you add that, you add Native American fascism, you add a German intelligence operation to a big, diverse, mainstream isolationist movement, and you end up with some combustible material there. Yeah, I'd like to turn to maybe the most Trumpian figure here, Charles Coughlin. But one of the things, I mean, he specifically, I think, either paraphrases or quotes Goebbels and, you know, there's the whole, the before the, or when the Nazis are first coming to power, there's the whole presentation in terms of, you know, sloughing off the effete elements of advanced society and a new kind of industry and purity that, you know, a, a whole different face that now seems 
both risable and dangerous to us, but you know, it, it was selling a little bit at the time. All right. So I think if there's a Trumpian figure in Ultra, um, it's it would be Father Charles Coughlin, who was just a name to me. You probably heard of him. Talk about so godsmacking. So when the population of this country is 120 million, thir- a full 30 million, a quarter of the country are listening to him every week. By far the most, um, you know, important and uh, listen to a radio show. Um, so. Well, let me start here. This is kind of an imponderable for historians, I know, so I, I shouldn't tag you with it. But just for discussion, how how important a figure is he to the whole story you tell? If there's a world where Coughlin's never born, does this actually happen? And I obviously, mm. it's it's the sort of parallel of, of similar questions one could ask about uh, Trump, whether, you know, you needed that kind of uh, spark to light the flame, because, you know, presumably at any given time, there are ragtag elements around. Uh, but man, he seems to have played a very, very critical role. Yeah. Yes. And when you describe those numbers about his his radio listenership, I mean, I think the thing that is when, when we try to make Coughlin an analog to some modern figure, whether it's a media figure or a political figure, I think it's you almost by necessity understate his influence by doing that because there's never been a media figure in the United States who had as big a reach and as much influence as Father Coughlin, just just in terms of the numbers, in terms of the number of people who are following him. And his political trajectory was interesting. In you know, 1932, 1933, 34, he's on FDR's side and he's uh, seen yeah. as being a progressive. Um, I mean, famously, his uh, his periodical and all his movements are called social justice, and that's sort of right. seen the way he's allied. By 1936, though, he is um, has formed a political party and is looking for a Huey Long before Huey Long is assassinated in 19, 1935, a Hu- Huey Long or a Huey Long type figure to offer a fascist alternative to American democracy. And by 1938, when Kristallnacht happens in Berlin. Coughlin is saying the Jews deserved it. Don't have any sympathy, Americans, for what you're hearing. More about than the deserved it, brought it on themselves. They're yes. they're, they're the cause of it. Yes. He's saying right, and there will be more worse to come if they continue their yeah. evil Jewish ways. Right. Um, he also say he's saying openly by 1936, we have to choose either communism or fascism. I choose the road of fascism, and he's arguing that America needs not only fascism, but it needs to be achieved through a violent takeover. He says, I choose the Franco way and we should choose the Franco way. And he's modeling a military dictatorship, military fascistic dictatorship along the lines of Francisco Franco for the United States. So to be that radical while also being the most listened to, most influential media figure in the history of the United States is really um, something to contend with. <laughs> yes, huge. It's huge. But in terms of what he really, what he contributes, I've thought a lot about this. I'm Catholic, and um, I think one of the dynamics that I think is underappreciated about the fascist organizing that was happening around that time is that Catholics were the targets of native fascist. Um, groups in the United States, like the Klan, right? We've never had a right, bigger, right, right. I mean, right? they until Kennedy, they were they were sort of their own lumpen for a time, yeah. Yes. Until, and right. there were Protestant movement, Protestant fascist movements at the time that were rapidly anti-Catholic, and th- yeah. in particular, there was a lot of organizing in Detroit that was really, really anti anti-Catholic. And when when Coughlin emerges in Detroit, um, he is the voice of Catholics who feel somewhat persecuted by the right. And then he brings his Catholic followers to the right and therefore sort of eliminates that as a barrier for organizing across different groups of white people and ethnic, different ethnic groups of white people and makes the fascist movement much bigger than it otherwise would have been. Because otherwise you would have had, you know, sort of Catholic politics and you would have had fascist fascist politics and never the twain should meet. He brought them together. And that ended up being really important for the isolationist movement because what was the big question the isolationists were and the and the interventionists were facing before before Pearl Harbor it was will we help Britain right Britain is the last democracy standing against the Nazis are we going to go help the UK Irish Catholics are not anybody Irish is disinclined <laughs> to helping the yeah. UK toward helping Britain and Coughlin uses that to bring Catholics into the isolationist 
and then ultimately the fascist side of the isolationist movement. And I don't think anybody could have done it but him. Yeah. And I mean, and he actually sounds the call. It, the uh, You know, he brings into from from a sort of movement to an actual violent on the street kind of of uh, agenda, the the Christian front. But I, I wanted to ask, because uh, you know, the compelling question, maybe the most for us today, is what makes these movements not not completely well. This one seems scrubbed from history, but at least peter out because um, it's around thirty eight, or he he does call the Christian front into into action and you know ballistic action guns and the like but my sense is also that you know crystal knocked 38 yeah on mm-hmm. november 9th i want to say and it's he is that goes a little bit too far a lot of sponsors abandon him and then of course after pearl harbor everything kind of changes but it i'm i was uh a little bit um uncertain because of the chronology and the way your eight episodes kind of unfurl. What, what is it? Not that does he basically just go a step too far and is no longer able to be, you know, listened to by polite America. And is that what brings it down? Because the Christian front, the big Madison square garden rally, et cetera, that post dates some of, some of the moves he makes that bring him into less, uh, you know, Good regard. Yeah. So he forms this militia group, the Christian Front, uh, and it actually has as radical as they are. And we know that they literally plot to overthrow the U.S. government. They oh, we build, got pictures they... with guns in this. Yeah. Everyone should look at your source material, by the way, after. The, it's really great stuff. Yeah. We, po- we posted it all, all episode. It's yeah. msnbc.com slash ultra. So it's easy to remember. But the, yeah. they learn to build bombs. They are stealing U.S. military material to build bombs and to stockpile military grade weapons, including machine guns, um, Browning light machine guns, which are a very, very potent weapon. Um, And even the Christian front has more militant offshoots that splinter off from them um, that want more, they want, they want pogroms, they want more attacks on Jews, they want to set off assassination plots earlier. I mean, it's, they're really um, quite, uh, kinetic as a as an activist uh, as as a revolutionary group, the Justice Department plays a role in right. stopping that. When in January 1940 they make a huge splash by arresting 17 members of the Christian Front, Coglin's militia. It's the New York chapter, and they do sort of catch them red-handed with stockpiles of bombs and guns, planning this big spree that they think is a big spree of violence that they think is going to set off um, a coup. Starting in, in so, New York City. And so, of course, they're charged and convicted. End of story. Just kidding. We're <laughs> going to get to that in a minute. Yeah. I, I, I want to ask you yeah. br- uh, br- very briefly, though, because it, uh, it was your interest as you talked about it, about the role of anti-Semitism in the whole thing. I, I think of anti-Semitism, especially in that era, as having kind of two different um, strains, the sort of protocols of the elders of Zion, Rothschild, Jews control the banks and the world, that sort of thing. But also, you know, uh, a more waspy version, I could say, you know, looking down on the Jews as kind of uh, groping and clannish and lump and whatever. I, I, I'm wondering, um, and by the way, you're, you know, ultra includes some um, uh, disparagement of Jews, but also some like Heil Hitler salutes and genocidal thoughts. So I'm just wondering what what was this, I guess, state of anti-Semitism in the country or how these, did these two uh, uh, strains uh, braid together here? Or is it really just the down and dirty, nastiest, you know, Christian front version that that has all the Force. I think it really is braided together the way that you're d- describing. I mean, the cog again, the Coglin part of it, not to get like too Catholic in, the, in terms yeah. of talking about oh. it, but I mean, it's a one of the really big problems in terms of bringing Coglin's followers and bringing Catholics into a fascist minded isolationist sect uh, is that at that time, the Catholic Church does not view anti Semitism as a sin. And so Coughlin is preaching nice anti-Semitic stuff. conspiratorial tropes from the yeah. pulpit. It's, and, it's, um, it's actually still Catholic doctrine that the Jews killed Jesus, right? Until the sixties. Yeah. And there's all yes, and there's and there's all sorts of there's all sorts of room um, through the church for Coughlin to literally preach anti-Semitic 
tropes of both high and low. And so um, he's talking about the real life persecution of the Jews in Germany and talking about how they need it and how street violence is cleansing. And we ought to have that kind of street violence here. That's pretty low. Um, that's pretty scurrilous in terms of the way that you're orienting that type of um, political work. But then he's also, you know, even, even when he was, you know, sort of on the left, when he was talking, when he was doing his populist organizing, it was all about taking, you know, taking America back from the globalists, right? Which yeah. is still here today. Um, and that sort of the the conspiracy. Yeah, no, that nostalgic strain of Nazism is yes. And the cons really the protocols point, of the yeah. elders of Zion and all that stuff. I mean, Henry Ford yeah. was you know he it, when he serialized the protocols yeah. of the elders of Zion in his in his paper, he ran it as a as a ninety two part series. Like that that's a lot of weeks. A ninety two part yeah. series is a long series. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and Coglin was Coglin was was running that at the same time. Hey everyone, we're taking a quick break to ask you to take a second to like and subscribe. It's a quick thing that really helps the show. Thanks, and back to the video. Okay, so um, man, this is going fast, but let's just take a couple minutes to move from the gobsmacking to the flat-out hallucinatory. <laughs> uh, tell us about this, what happens after the 17 are arrested in 1940 and the the uh, the maybe tortuous path of justice that ensues or doesn't. Yeah, this is in an era where you know J. Stunning. Edgar Hoover is, is is not exactly like you know running a big. And J. Edgar Hoover is not the captain of Antifa, right? Like he is not particularly <laughs> focused on the right. He never has been over the entire course of his decades running the FBI. But the Christian Front thing is bad enough. I mean, they've got an informant inside the. The Christian Front, who's talking about the stolen military materiel. They've got active duty National Guard people who are helping them. They've got a lot of cops who are helping them. They are stockpiling bombs. They've got a dozen members of Congress they've slated for assassination. The FBI comes to the belief that this plot is within a week of going off, and they finally decide to move. And Hoover personally uh, does the press conference where he announces it. It's front page news across the country. It's this very big deal. That's January 1940. April 1940, they go to trial. By June, they're all either acquitted or let off in a mistrial. It's just, it doesn't work. They put them on trial in uh, EDNY in, in, in Brooklyn, and the, um, they didn't do a very good job with selecting the jury. It turns out the forewoman of the jury was the first cousin of um, the spiritual, the Catholic spiritual advisor to the Christian Front, Coglin's man in New York, who oversaw the Christian Front. There, his cousin was the forewoman of the jury. Um, hey, by the way, did the def you have defense attorney questions on stunning stuff about it? Were those actually asked? Do you know they so, they proffer voir dire questions? How much do you hate the Jews or yes. whatever? Yeah, are you right. a Jew? Are you a Jew yeah. or a Jewess? Are you? Yeah, yes, right. Like, really? So, are, did, were those actually yeah asked? Do you know? So for we know in the 1944 sedition trial in Washington, which yeah. of those were asked, and some of them indeed were. Um, we know both in 1940 in Brooklyn and in 1944 in Washington, there were no Jewish people on the jury. Um, but at least Eicher, who was the judge in in 44, he didn't ask all the questions that he was uh, that the defense counsel gave him. In the 1940 trial, we don't have a clear transcript that tells us exactly what were asked, but we know that defense counsel was able to keep uh, were able to keep every every Jew off the jury, which in Brooklyn yeah. took some doing, right? I mean. Yeah, um, good point. Yeah, yeah. My, it was a, the, my the, mom was there at the time. She, I guess she didn't get on. They picked a, a yeah. heavily German American, yeah. um, uh, German American and Irish American jury, and the and the prosecutor who ends up being the prosecutor of the Great Sedition Trial four years later in in D.C. John Raggi, um is isn't able to pull it off and. Coughlin sees this as a great vindication. Oh, you came at me and you lost. We're now going to be emboldened and we're going to do more. I think the truth of that is a little more subtle. I do actually think the publicity about what the Christian Front members were doing, the fact that the trial was brought, the allegations that were made in court, even though they were acquitted, it was a little bit of an eye opener as to how radical Coughlin and his followers had become. I do actually think it hurt his his influence. Um, but of course, you know, by then we're getting very close to the start of the war anyway. 
Yeah, but but anyway, I I, uh, I this is actually a good segue to the present because there's all this thinking about you know as you feel questions should Trump be prosecuted? What's it look like if he's prosecuted and not convicted? Because you know here and in forty four, it's not as if they're exonerated, but but they have a kind of circus bedlam strategy that I think there you, you see echoes of with the Proud Boys and Oath Keepers, but mm-hmm. it actually succeeds. All right, if we could, well, let me just say very quickly um, that uh, how how cool is this that uh, Steven Spielberg's Amblin Entertainment has optioned the film rights to Ultra, so we'll be seeing it come to the big screen. You can think about who plays Coglin. Um, I had some thoughts, but okay, um, I did want to marry this up to today, and which of course at every moment, I, th- what this is part of the gobsmacking. Uh, uh, reaction. I was like, how did I not know that? And oh my God, this, this, you can almost draw like a graph. This, the Coughlin lines to Trump and this speech to that. And it's so, there's so much overlap. Um, let me just serve it up generally. What did you see as you got deeper and deeper into this story as the main points of similarity and contrast between the version of domestic terrorism, you know, we've seen in this country in the last two plus years with the version that you chronicle in Ultra. The thing that I ended up taking away for it was sort of a a good guy's point and a bad guy's point. Um, And on the bad guy's point, I think what was revelatory to me, and I think was a new new history to almost everybody listening to this, was that you had these really radical, violent, far right, ultra right movements married to right-wing politics, married to yes. electoral politics towards, in, in the case of like uh, this specific senators, story. Senators, congressmen, yeah. Yeah, it's two dozen members of Congress who are in, in some ways linked through a Nazi agent who was operating in Congress, but also linked to these very extreme groups. And there is something that we need to, I think, appreciate about um, the the way it supercharges ultra-radical politics to be adjacent to electoral politics. There is something that is more than the sum of its parts for those two things coming together. So for me, that was important. Like, I I feel like we have a lot of, forgive me, I think we have a lot of bad members of Congress now and sort of scandalous and like, I can't believe this person's a member of Congress. We've had really bad members of Congress before too. (laughs) And so I want to know, I, I wanted to be able to document that and talk about that in terms of what that meant for Dangerous politics. Can I can I do a quick follow up to that? Sure. Because that struck me as one of the the contrasts. The, these different players, you, and there's at least a you say up to twenty, and you and you really go into you know three, four Hamilton Fish and and Ernest Lundin and the like. But it strikes me that what we didn't have and we have today is pretty close to a full on you know endorsement or affiliation of a political party qua political party. And it often feels as if until there's some kind of root and branch reform of the Republican Party, we're in a world of hurt. And that and that was less so then. It struck me that maybe some people were in it for the money. Other, well, you as you put it, uh, as you mentioned in all, you know, Rogue it goes to Germany after the war finds a lot of deeper involvement than people knew. And yet it feels somewhat more um splintered and sporadic mm-hmm. rather than a, an almost official imprimatur that that uh, you get from the Republican Party of today. Yes. And you're you're getting at something that I think is important here, which is the members of Congress that we document in, in the podcast and that are known to have been engaged with this Nazi agent and sort of adjacent to these violent movements and everything, they're from both parties. It's not that they are mm. all Republicans. We we focus a lot on Hamilton Fish, and he's a Republican, but we also focus on Burton Wheeler. He's not a Republican. Um, and there's a bunch of Democrats who are real bad guys in this, um, and a bunch of Republicans who are real bad guys. And conversely, there's good guys who are Republicans and Democrats, too. The, the dividing line here in terms of where you found this sort of bolus, a very dangerous, very radical extreme politics, in some cases allied with the Hitler government, was in isolationism. It wasn't in within one party's strictures. And that's an interesting thing, right? That's a, that's something that doesn't map super neatly onto what we have now. But it did create a challenge for the isolationist movement that is a little bit akin to, I think, what the challenge is for the Republican movement right now, right? Like, like we said at the outset, there's nothing 
there's nothing inherently wrong or extreme about being isolationist ahead of ahead of our involvement in World War II. It was a rational thing. It was a reasonable thing. We, looking back on it, would certainly, I think, disagree with that position. But people held that view in good faith. All the people who held that view in good faith, though, then were confronted with the fact that there was a large faction within their movement that was taking money and instruction from Hitler and supporting violent, the violent armed overthrow of the United States. That movement then needed to contend with that uh, and box it out and isolate it and condemn it. And they did so to greater or lesser success, um, depending on which year you're looking at it and who was doing it. But it's um it is there is a self-regulatory need. You can uh you know anti-fascists can confront fascists and that is needed and necessary and we've had to do that as as a country for for a century now. But you also need conservatives to confront fascists. Um and you need it to come from within their among their fellow travelers for it to be effective. Um, otherwise, you end up just with this radical kernel that keeps churning out dangerousness um, o- over time. So, yeah, I, I, yeah the, resonance is, the, re- the resonance is the resonance. You don't want to be too. It's not. You don't want to be say that it's too on the nose. You need to sort of take what's useful from it, but also recognize how history has intervened in some ways. Very much. Well, that, on that to that point, right? You had the uh, intervention of Pearl Harbor, which was a you know a seismic event. I don't think. And I, I hope, in fact, that we don't have something like that in our near future. Yeah. What about the role of uh, race and religion today and among the both Proud Boys Oath Keepers, but also the 140 or 39 Republicans, uh, and, and by contrast to uh, the, the different movements that coalesce in ultra? I think that we should get more explicit about the relationship between racism and fascism. Um, and I would, I would, for the, for this purpose, I would put anti-Semitism under the, under the, the umbrella of, of racism. What fascism yeah. is in America is saying, you know, democracy is a problem that the problem that we have as a country is that the wrong people get a say in the way the country goes and the way we are governed. And there are people who ought not get a say and the government ought to be run against them instead of by them, right? It's a, it, it's a rejection of the idea of um, egalitarian and multiracial democracy. In order to get people to that point of view, you need to define some people as being unworthy in participating in decision-making about governing. And that has to be because they are alien, because they are evil, because uh, they are the inherently other, criminal, yeah. they're the other. And anti-Semitism always comes, you know, always comes to the fore. It's never, never far below the surface. And the sort of radical anti-Semitism that elements of the far right are trying to platform right now um, is, I think, a big, big alarm bell going off right now. But it's not a separate thing from the far right interest in authoritarian solutions to what they're defining as the problem. If you want, a, if you don't want elections and you want a strong man to come in and run the country the way it's supposed to be run for the people who ought to be privileged in this country and the other people who shouldn't be participating in these discussions should be outed, or should, should be ousted from the, the decision making process. That fascist authoritarian longing always, always has to come with scapegoating of the people who you want to define as other. And it's anti-Semitism, it's anti-queer stuff, it's anti-trans stuff, and it's anti-Black and anti- uh, and pro-white. Um, it's, 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 it's racism of all kinds. Those things aren't just, um, you know, it's not like one's a motorcycle, one's a sidecar. Those, that's, those are the two wheels on the front axle of this type of ultra-right thinking. That's a really great point. Um, so I have a sort of final closeout question. If you have, if you have a couple of minutes course, more, yeah. Do you, okay. Well, so I yeah, I mean it's sort of the question we've been building towards, and you've covered it um, generally. But you know, thinking about both the '40s and today, so presumably there's always some not just antisocial elements, but but really you know repugnant uh, elements in the U.S. population who would make war on the country. And the gripping question is what makes them come to prominence, and then what makes them recede. So uh, I, don't, I don't think anyone has the you know, crystal ball uh, uh, certain answer here, but, but hopefully one day the plague is lifted from us. Do, do you have a sense 
uh, informed by the lessons of the 40s flirtation with sedition about how our current uh, troubles end and what basically has to happen for, I, I don't think they'll ever be as obscure in history as as ultra as the forties uh, that ultra took the cover off was, but but for it to be uh, uh, history and not such a pressing week to week danger. Part of the reason that I do this stuff and the reason that my bookshelf looks the way it does and the reason that I read so much about this is that I do think history helps. And for me, yeah. the most helpful thing is knowing that we have contended with this kind of thing and worse before. Um, and not just the bad guys here are forgotten, the good guys are forgotten too. Um, yeah. Ultra is mostly the story of the Department of Justice contending with this and sort of trying and failing to handle this through the criminal law and why that didn't work. And But but the that's not it. It's not only the Department of Justice. It's not only the criminal law. It's not only our formal systems of accountability that work. It's Americans being anti-fascist and doing that work. It's journalism. It's protecting journalists who do this work when they ultimately get attacked, both institutionally and individually, for having investigated and called out this sort of thing, told the truth about what these groups are up to. It's counter-organizing. Um, we talked a lot about the sort of Coughlin's influence among American Catholics. There were faith-driven American Catholic anti-fascist organizers who bird dogged those people and made their lives miserable and exposed what they were doing. And it's also political accountability. I mean, what you get when you get good activists and you get good journalists and you can get the truth out about what these groups are doing and what they're trying to hide and sort of what they're trying to pull on the American people, um, you can you can inform you can inform the polity, you can inform the voters. And I think the big good news story about what happened in the 40s is not that Pearl Harbor came in and interrupted everything and made us all open our eyes and then the fascists yeah. melted away. It was that almost all of these members of Congress who were hooked up with Nazi agents, who were hooked up with this kind of ultra-right violent extremism, almost to a one, they were voted out, including yeah, ones who had been like there for decades. Right. Yes. The voters kicked yeah. them out. And voters kicked them out in primaries. Political parties in the states excluded them from running again. And when they made it to the general election, general election voters voted them out. And that was because they had the information about what kind of extremism these guys were selling and the American people didn't want it. And I think that through line comes straight through today in a way that is not weakening at all. And this last midterm, you know, it's not, I don't know if this will be seen as a historic midterm, but the, the election deniers, which is people who don't want democracy. They want an authoritarian form of government instead. That's what election denial is about. They lost all across the country, not everywhere, but most places they lost, including in places where they were favored. And that is, that's 1944, right? That's, that's what the elections looked like when these guys came up before the voters during ultra as well. And the American people have stood against this stuff when they know, when they know it's happening. And I believe we will continue to do that. From your lips. And let me just add as a lawyer, the role of of the courts who have been pretty important in actually speaking the truth when their time has finally come. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Rachel Maddow, both for a riveting podcast and a fascinating conversation today about its echoes with uh, the, the contemporary times. It's uh, been a great pleasure. I hope you'll return one day to I absolutely uh, visit will, us Harry. again. Thank you so much. I feel like with Talking Feds, I'm like, a, it's like talk radio, you know, long time listener, first time caller. So it's a real <laughs> thrill, long time thank thrill for me to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in. If you enjoyed this video and other Talking Feds content, please take a second to like and subscribe. Talk to you later.